And good morning. good morning, and welcome to worship. I invite you to please stand now as you are comfortable. For our opening litany comes in from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. For he will hide me in his sh shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servants away in anger. You who have been my help, do not, 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 not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And let us pray. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy, that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And please be seated. Once again, good morning, resurrection. Thank you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice 
and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Tim Nybrot, and I want to welcome you here. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, a special welcome goes out to you. We're delighted that you're here, and please come and worship with us again real soon. For our guests today, we do have those green guest connection cards. They're in the seat back in front of you. If you'd be so kind to fill it out, it gives us a better chance to know you and serve you in ministry, and you can just place that green card in the offering basket when the offering is passed. And may, that, may this be your gift to us here today, that we might get to know one another. There's also welcome bags out on the patio for our guests. There's more information about Resurrection Lutheran Church in those bags, and there's a little gift in there for you as well. So welcome to worship on the second Sunday in the season of Lent, and welcome home. And it's my joy today to also introduce to you um, Wyatt Lindy. Wyatt, come on up. And uh, I know Wyatt's girlfriend, Lindsay, is here too. Welcome, Lindsay. Good to see you, Wyatt. Uh, as many of you know, as I shared last week, we have the joy of having an intern this coming year here at Resurrection, and it's going to be Wyatt. So we, uh, we welcome Wyatt. And uh, Wyatt is uh, currently in his last semester at Princeton Theological Seminary. And how's that going, Wyatt? It's going really well. Good, yeah. good. And I know there's probably a lot of papers, a lot of tests that are upcoming this next few months. And Wyatt's going to be starting in mid-June here at Resurrection. And so uh, Wyatt's going to be out on the patio after worship here this morning. Please, please go up and introduce yourself to him. Welcome him and certainly meet uh, Lindsay as well. And uh, Wyatt will be around uh, campus for a few days and we, we look forward to welcoming him. Let's have a prayer for Wyatt. Lord, we give you thanks for Wyatt. We thank you for the call to ministry that you've placed in his heart, his life. We certainly thank you for all those who have uh, supported him in this, uh, this calling, this journey. And certainly, Lord, as he finishes up this last semester at seminary, bless and keep him. We look forward to welcoming him in June here at Resurrection as our intern. And uh, we look forward to all the ways that he shares his gifts in this place. Bless and keep him now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. That's again, once again, let's welcome Wyatt. And please get to know him. First reading is found in the book of Genesis, beginning at the 15th chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our second reading is from the book of Philippians, the third chapter. 
Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ. Please be seated. So throughout this season of Lent, our theme here at worship is cross purposes. Cross purposes. And our hope, our prayer, is that this theme centers us and that it will help us remember and recognize God's purposes as we stand at the foot of the cross. Because that's where the season leads to, right? The foot of the cross. And so as we journey through this season together, as we walk in humility and repentance, we pray that each one of us will come to realize that God's promises are fulfilled. That our sins are crossed out only at the cross of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Gracious God, your son shows the path which led to pain before joy and the cross before glory. Plant his cross in our hearts this Lenten season so that in its power and in its love, we may come at last to joy and glory. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. You know, one of the great blessings of being a pastor here at Resurrection is that I get to know and have a relationship with the children of this church. It's a joy. I also get to meet their parents and welcome them. And I love seeing them in worship, certainly participating in our ministries, our programs. Because you've all heard it said, right, that the children are the future of the church. Well, I want to refute that statement here this morning because they're not just the future of the church. Friends, they are the church today. And they are so very important. Every time I hear a child's voice in worship, every time I hear a baby crying, right? And you see the parents, they're, they're ready to grab their baby and take them out to the nursery or out to the lobby. And I said, no, no, stay, stay in worship because we need to hear that voice more in this place. Yeah, I take great delight in seeing our young families worshiping. We certainly pray for more children, right? More young families in our worship services. And it's not because of numbers. Rather, we want to see more children, more parents, so that they may know the love and the grace of God. 
And so here's the challenge for everyone here this morning. If you do not know any of our children in this church, if you do not know any of our young families, I challenge you, I implore you, please, please get to know them. They're wonderful. Somehow, some way, get to know them. You probably need to be creative. You may need to ask one of the pastors or one of our staff members on how you might go about doing this. But if you see one of our young families, maybe it's after worship today out on the patio, or if you cross paths with them in one of our programs, or maybe you see them at the grocery store on the street corner, please introduce yourself to them. Can you do that? Make them feel welcomed. Make them feel appreciated in this place. It is our mission to be a family-friendly church. And I believe that when we establish relationships across the generations, especially in the church, we're a greater picture of what the body of Christ is all about. And we are better. Now, speaking of, of children, a few years back, I, I led... Uh, a weekend retreat at one of our beautiful Lutheran Bible camps for 165 excited teenagers and 15 adult chaperones. We arrived on, on Friday evening and right away we started in on an incredible and emotional and a spiritual experience. Campfires, right, with singing, singing Kumbaya. Team building exercises, Bible studies, swimming, canoeing, and it was awesome. But it was also so exhausting, especially for the 15 adult chaperones. By Sunday afternoon, we were all weary from too little sleep and too much Taylor Swift and Bruno Mars playing from their cell phones. And yet the teenagers were still excited. They were still raring to do things. And we still had three more hours to go before the buses would arrive to take us home. What were we going to do? We we're so exhausted. Well, one of the adults shouted out, why don't we play the game Chickens and Foxes? I'd never heard of the game before, but I was game. They gathered all the kids on the field and then had them form a huge circle. And then the chaperone who had recommended the game explained the rules. We'll come around and whisper in your ear whether you are a fox or you're a chicken. Then on the first whistle, all the chickens will run and they'll go hide. And a couple seconds later, on the second whistle, whistle all the foxes will go find the chickens and bring them back to the spot. Chickens hide, foxes chase, right? Got it? And everyone understood the rules and so we started. We walked around the circle and we gave out assignments, fox or chicken, and then someone blew the whistle, and all the kids went running to hide in a place on this 20-acre piece of property. Well, what we didn't mention to all the teenagers is that we had assigned them all to be chickens <laughs> and none to be foxes. In other words, all 165 of them would be hiding, we presumed, for the next hour or so, and therefore we adults, we could take a nap. <laughs> It was genius, but it didn't work. It only took about 10 minutes for the kids to figure out that something wasn't quite right, but we tried. You know, friends, in our gospel reading this morning, it's a fascinating story that, that Luke tells us. It begins with the Pharisees, and remember, they were the enemies of Jesus. The Pharisees tell Jesus, you know, you better be careful. Because Herod wants to kill you. Maybe you should leave this place. Maybe you should go back to your hometown of Nazareth or, or go fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Or better yet, maybe you want to go hide from Herod in the wilderness in Judea. Because if you don't, Herod's going to find you. And when he does, he's going to kill you. And we're just telling you this for your own good. That's the Pharisees. Now, the way that this sounds is that the Pharisees are doing Jesus a favor. But let me assure you, they aren't doing Jesus any favors. Remember, they despise Jesus. And they're trying to get rid of him by any means necessary. Look again, if you would, just turn back to your bulletin at that gospel text from Luke chapter 13. And look at Jesus' response to the Pharisees. 
It isn't what they were expecting. Because Jesus was fearless. He responds to them, you tell that fox Herod to bring it on. You tell him that I'll be here doing my work today and tomorrow, but I'll be all finished on the third day. Now, by responding this way, was Jesus offering the leaders a a foreshadowing of Holy Week? You know, Friday I'll die, Saturday I'll still, still be dead, but on the third day I will come back to life, and then my work will all be accomplished. Is that what Jesus was saying here? Or was he simply stating the obvious? That the leaders of Jerusalem will do to him what they had always done to the prophets of God, they would kill him. They would kill him like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Amos. Like they killed John the Baptist and Stephen and Peter and in our generation, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King Jr. And why? Why why did they kill him? Well, because prophets spoke the truth of God. They spoke God's truth. And the people, they didn't like it. We still don't. We still don't like being pointed out our shortcomings. We don't like prophets telling us that we're proud or selfish or sinful or mean-spirited. And we hear that in Jesus' words, listen to what he says. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. But notice very, something very important in this text. The boldness of God gives way to the heart of God. Because in the very next verse, Jesus goes on to say, Oh, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather your children like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you are not willing. You see, in five brief verses of Scripture, Jesus makes this a story of foxes and chickens. And now he is the mother hen who would sacrifice his own body for the sake of his vulnerable children. But they all went scurrying, right, away for other safe havens. They, they retreated to rules because rules are always good. They hid behind religious tradition because who could argue with that? They tried to protect themselves by gaining seats of power and threats of punishment and leverages of guilt and obligation and requirement. But Jesus, Jesus employed none of those familiar religious conditions, Right? Now, he offered love and grace and forgiveness. And the people of Jerusalem said, "Mm, no, no, thank you, Jesus. You and I know that we are living in an age of great change and upheaval. It's a time of letting go of the former practices that our parents, our grandparents has held. As a culture, we have wandered away from worship. We have abandoned religious principles as the guiding forces of our lives. We have replaced the priorities of giving and serving with books of self-help and self-actualization. And in the process, we have not so much become disobedient to God as we have deemed God to be irrelevant. And what I find most ironic is that there are foxes everywhere in this world today. Vultures who would prey upon our children, internet hackers who can find their way into the secret files of our lives, sick or violent people who would approach us with a knife or a gun or with a speeding car. Some live with deep uncertainty for the future, while others live with a deep remorse from the past. And then we see those quirky religious peddlers calling out for us to follow them to prosperity, right? If you believe in Jesus, everything is going to be fine. If you believe, you will be be given the riches of this world. One just has to turn on the TV to see that. Or follow them to good karma or follow them to being one with Mother Earth. You know, all of that is like the mackerel in the moonlight, right? It looks really good, but it smells pretty bad. And yet one thing has never changed. There's still the voice that calls out to us, calls out to you and to me. Oh, how often I have desired to gather you together 
as a hen gathers her chicks. Jesus says that I can offer you safe harbor in the storm and love in spite of your faults and hope in spite of your darkness. And I can forgive you for the past, no questions asked. And when you wander away in search of the next new thing, I will welcome you home and do it all over again because I love you. And like a parent separated from her child, my heart aches for you when you are in a desert place. It is essentially the same offer, right, that Jesus made to those of first century Jerusalem and has made to the people of every age. And we respond, no thank you, Jesus. But not always. Not always. You know, this past week I received a warm note from a member of this congregation whom we haven't seen for a while, at least not on a consistent basis. And the note said this, Pastor Tim, so we drift in and out of church. People call that phenomenon what they want, but busy family life, messed up priorities, whatever. But the thing that always gets us back to church is the welcoming spirit and the good humor and the powerful messages in that place. So God is not irrelevant after all. And faith is not abandoned after all. In the milieu that is our world, Jesus is still able to break through the self-reliant exterior of our lives and call us home. And even though we don't hear his voice audibly, we sense that reconnecting with God is something that we need to do. And who knows, maybe that describes you here this morning. Something got you here this morning. And it wasn't our fantastic coffee and our donut holes. But you're home. I love welcoming you each Sunday morning by saying, welcome home. You're home. And Jesus has indeed drawn you under the shadow of his wings for this one hour to remind you that you are safe now and loved now and surrounded by family. You know, today I want to close with two undeniable truths. The first is this, that our culture is changing dramatically. It's not going back to the way things were in the 1970s and 1980s. So deal with it. And if you think you can change the momentum of a nation, of a world, simply by bringing your neighbors cookies or by giving someone you see on the street corner a few bucks, well, you're probably deluded, right? <laughs> well, that is right. But that doesn't mean that you should do nothing. It's an age-old story now, but you remember the story. There was a man who was walking along the ocean shore, and he sees someone at a distance who appeared to be dancing on the beach. And the closer that he got, the more clearly he saw the man was throwing starfish into the sea. The beach was littered with starfish, and he was picking them up one by one, throwing them into the water. When he got close enough, he asked the man, what are you doing? There are so many starfish here, you can't possibly make a difference. And then the man reached down, picked up another starfish, tossed it as far as he could into the surf, and he turned to the man and he said, made a difference for that one. You know, friends, the way that you live does matter. The way that you care for people does matter. The faith that compels you to love and forgive and to offer comfort and peace does matter even only if one life at a time. The second truth is this. The church is not going away. God is bigger than any cultural trend. Our present circumstances are not the worst thing that God has ever observed in creation. The people of God have endured wars and famines and depressions and internal abuse for 2,000 years now. And we are still, we're still a source of hope in the world. And I say we because that's what the church is. It is us. It is the faithful people gathering for worship. It is a new generation of children learning, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's, a, it's generous saints who invest their gifts in future saints. It is young people who hop in a car and travel a half hour south of here to Santa Rita Park so that our brothers and sisters in Christ who are homeless might have a warm meal to eat. 
It is incredible people on our staff here at Resurrection, and we do have an incredible staff who stand up each day and say, I want to use my gifts to serve this church in any way that I can. It is people who are in our, our Lenten book study and who are in our life groups who say, I want to be surrounded by authentic, genuine community that I can grow in faith with. So friends, the church is still here. Jesus said that not even the gates of hell shall be able to prevail against us. Yes, God has ordained the church and deemed it so. And that's the truth, little chicks. That's the truth. Praise be to you, God. Amen. Please be seated. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Let us pray. You gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. You unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news, even in the face of opposition, and to protect those whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Lord, today we pray for all in crisis as Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. Bring an end to war. Bring an end to division. Merciful God. You create the entire universe and call it good. Hinder those who would cause further destruction to our planet's fragile ecosystems and augment the calls of those who advocate for the thoughtful stewardship of the earth's resources. Merciful God. You raise up leaders committed to love and justice, nurture in those who govern, patience to receive criticism, openness to new ideas, and courage to change course when needed for the sake of the common good. Merciful God. You hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child. Console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving. Lord, today we especially pray for all those wrestling with ongoing COVID symptoms. We also pray this day for all who have suffered in the wake of deadly U.S. tornadoes. Merciful God. You kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide children and adults preparing for baptism or confirmation. Empower Sunday school teachers, confirmation leaders, and parents who share their faith with younger generations. 
Give us all a renewed sense of vocation. Merciful God, you welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labor on earth are ended and who now rest with you. On the final day, gather all of us with them in your loving arms. Merciful God, accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, as we journey through Lent, give us a will of repentance, a mind of sacrificial love, and a heart of gratitude. Indeed, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We offer our gifts and our whole selves, asking that you might strengthen us for the journey. In the name of Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, 
your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. At this time, we invite those who will be communing at your chair today to take out your Holy Communion cup. And after the Lord's Prayer, I'll instruct on all of us how to partake in the meal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. He gave for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. This time I do invite the communion assistants to come forward. For those of you who are communing at your chair this morning, as you eat the bread, this is the body of Christ given for you. And as you drink of the cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you who are coming forward for Holy Communion, this morning we'll have two stations at the front. Ushers will direct you forward. At the first station, you'll receive a wafer of bread. We ask you to eat it and then move to the next station. We'll receive a cup of either white grape juice or red wine. After you drink of it, you can place the cup into the basket. And here at Resurrection, we believe that these are God's gifts for all of God's people, so everyone is welcome. Come now, for all is ready.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Just a few ministry announcements here this morning. Once again, if you're a guest with us, we're so happy that you're here. Please come and join us for worship again real soon. We do want to again welcome Wyatt, Lindy, and Lindsay to it with us today. Uh, please get to know them out on the patio. Uh, we do have coffee and those wonderful donor holes after worship. So if you don't know someone, introduce yourself to them and welcome them. We do have midweek Lenten services every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon outdoors in our Memorial Plaza. Those uh, Wednesday services will go from now until April 6th. Uh, this week we're looking at the story from Mark chapter 10, the healing of blind Bartimaeus. There will be a uh, intentional prayer gathering this coming Tuesday, uh, March 15th at 1015 here in the sanctuary. We're gathering for two specific reasons. We want to gather for intentional prayer for the people of Ukraine and for an end to the war and division. We'll also be giving information on how we plan on strengthening and improving the resurrection prayer ministry so that we can meet the growing prayer needs of this congregation and beyond. So come join the pastors, council members, and staff as we gather for this important time. Again, that's an intentional prayer gathering this Tuesday at 1015. There will be a senior vocal recital for Josh Elias. Josh, wave your hand up there. It's this coming Tuesday, uh, March 15th at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, Josh is a senior at the University of Arizona, and we look forward to that recital. Thanks, Josh. There will be a memorial service for longtime member Bob Mack. Uh, that will be on Friday, March 18th at 2 o'clock. Our reception immediately following over in Katie's quarters in the Outreach Center. So please, if you would, keep Romana and Bob's family in your prayers. The Flim Golf Classic is coming up on March 28th. I've signed up. How about you? Uh, and to learn more about the Flim Golf outing, uh, I think Pete is here today. There he is. Pete, welcome. Let's pull that out if you want. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see more people coming back to church following the COVID flare-up. Anyway, uh, Flim. Does anybody know what Flim is? What it stands for? Does anybody? Somebody does. Well, in case you don't know, it stands for Future Leaders in Ministry. Unfortunately, college costs a lot of money, and graduates in just about any program are in severe debt. And in the ministry field, if you have a passion for being in that field, it's pretty tough to finish with that much debt after six years of school and go out and take a low paying job and pay off that debt. It's tough. Uh, I graduated from college back in the 60s or 70s, I can't remember, it's been so long ago. And I had a, I had a college loan and uh, we started paying it back uh, seven years after I graduated and I think finally 15 years after graduation it finally was paid off. And it felt like getting a raise. And I can't imagine what it's like to be a hundred or more thousand dollars in debt. So the goal of FLIM, Future Leaders in Ministry, was originated by Ken Allstrand, Pastor Ken Allstrand. He had four daughters. Can you imagine how much it cost him to send his four daughters to college? So he was pretty smart to figure this out. He uh, organized in Oro Valley here. Uh, the golf tournament to help raise funds for future leaders. And we're hosting that tournament again this year. I think it's the 18th, 19th. It's, it's, it's getting up there close to 20 years in a row. Uh, we're going to have it on March 28th uh, at Oro Valley Country Club. If you've never been there, what a beautiful place. You should come and see it. You can enter the tournament as a foursome or as an individual and you'll be teamed up with other people. It's a scramble event. It is a scramble event. That means everybody tees off and you select the best shot and then continue on from there. Uh, so golf is easy. It's the only sport that the ball doesn't move while you're trying to hit it. <laughs> it's really easy. I've been trying all my life. And uh, it's, uh, well, anyway, that's another story. Uh, so anyway, come and see us. We have a, a registration table out uh, in the, on the patio here. Uh, Mr. Gil Tostengrad is out, is out there uh, and he'll answer your questions. We do have a brochure for you all.
to look at and read. Uh, we have an organizational um, uh, website and uh, plenty of room. Oh, by the way, if you're not a golfer and you'd like to help these future students out, uh, we'd love your donations. And we have T sponsors. Uh, we have uh, individual donations, any, anything like that. Just make it out to F-L-I-M. And think about people with a passion for the ministry that may get to finish up that goal with your help. Thank you very much. I could certainly speak to coming out of seminary with that. Maybe why you could speak of that too. And uh, knowing that these type of events, uh, these future leaders and ministry events like uh, that we're having on the 28th of this month really helps our leaders and coming out and so they can serve churches uh, all over the country. And uh, so thank you for your support. It's been a number of years that we've been hosting FLIM and it's, it's a wonderful event. It's a fun event. And so come on out for that. I invite you to please stand now for the benediction. For this purpose, Christ came, and for this purpose, he died, to bring salvation to all. May the Lord who brought salvation to all through the cross bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. we join together now in our church's mission statement. Called by God's Spirit, we are to be the presence of Christ in our daily lives so that others will follow him. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the journey. Thanks be to God.